Well, good morning. We read today in God's Word from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This is our reading for today. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, as you have brought us all to this place at, at this time and, and for this purpose, Lord, to receive your word, to, to hear what you have to say, and to be reminded of the incredible grace and mercy that you pour into our lives each and every day, we know that it's all made possible by our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we pray this all in his name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brady. If I missed you at the very beginning, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Hill. It is wonderful to have you with us here this morning. We're in week six of a seven-week series of learning who our God is. We're studying the attributes of God so that we can better know who he is. And today we're tackling two attributes of his that are very similar, grace and mercy. And when we talk about grace and mercy, it's important to understand that, that these aren't just things that God is. He is the very essence of what this word means. When we understand the word grace and understand the word mercy, it is because it first comes from God and he is the one doing this and now we know what these words mean. And so for those of you that, that might not know, just a little refresher, the most basic understanding of the word mercy is not receiving what you deserve. That it, it, you have done something, there is something that you have done and a punishment that you have coming and to not receive that is mercy. And when you talk about mercy, it's when God's goodness confronts our guilt and our suffering, it results in God's mercy that he, he is merciful to us. You see, a lot of people, they, they look at the Bible and they say, okay, the God of the Old Testament, that's everything before Jesus. He, he was a harsh God. He was kind of like last week when we talked about um, the, the wrath and the punishment, that that's the kind of God. And then you get to the New Testament. When Jesus comes, then he's merciful, then he's gracious. But what's interesting is mercy, the word mercy is used four times as much in the Old Testament as the New Testament. That he is the same God throughout. And God was merciful all throughout. You can look at the stories of Abraham and Noah and uh, Isaac and J Joseph and Jacob and Moses, Samson, David, Saul, all throughout the Old Testament, God showed and these men attested he is merciful. So this is nothing new. Our God has always been merciful. He, is, he has always been withholding the wrath that we deserve and not doling out the punishments that we deserve. But then also there's grace. And the understanding of grace, very simply, is this, receiving what you do not deserve, getting blessings that you haven't earned. This is what grace is. And there's no story in the Bible that better encapsulates to understand what grace and mercy truly is than a story that Jesus gives us called the prodigal son. You see, Jesus himself is giving this story. And it's in Luke chapter 15. I'm going to be uh, looking at it right here. If you want to open your Bibles or, or look at it, um, but I'll be telling you it. Uh, Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. And the story goes like this. It's Jesus speaking to try and teach us what grace and mercy is all about. And he says there's a, a wealthy father, and he has a, a lot of land, and, and he has tons of, of uh, crops, and he has tons of animals. He has workers, and he has two sons. And one day the younger son comes to the father and says, I want what's mine and I want to go. Now, just like today, we have to understand the significance of what he's saying. Because if you're a child, you don't get your inheritance until your father what? Dies. And so what this son is saying is he's coming up to the father and he's saying, I want no part of this family. I don't want to sit here and help you keep this empire up. I don't want to sit here and serve. I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to be in relationship with you or my brother or anybody. I'm, you all are dead to me. All you are to me is a paycheck and I want it now and I want to be gone. I want no relationship with you. And this is a big deal because the, it's not like the father just has one third of his estate in cash because that's how it would divide out. The older brother would get two thirds and the younger brother one third. It's not like he just has one third of his estate in cash. So that means he had to sell livestock. He had to sell land. He had to do all this and cash out his son. And, and his son's sitting there saying, I don't care what it costs you. I don't care. Give me my money. I'm gone. And we have to imagine this broke the father's heart. I mean, if you were the dad, what would you do? I know what I, I'd be like, shut your mouth and get back out in there in the field. You know, like, but that's not what he does. The father graciously, he gives the son what he does not deserve. And he cashes it out 
and he gives it to him and as the son walks away with that money the father has no idea if he'll ever see that son again he has no idea what's going to happen in that boy's life he doesn't know if he's going to have a family and kids or what he, he just sees his son go off and that's all he knows he doesn't know if he'll ever hear from him again but he is gracious to his son and then it says the son goes off and he goes into a foreign land and he's just wild living with food and drink and, and, and women and he's spending all this money and then he's broke and then a great famine hits the land and it's to the point that, that he has nothing to eat and he is literally feeding pigs for just survival and he is looking at what the pigs are eating and he's thinking man that looks good now I don't know about you but I've been to a farm a couple times and I have seen what pigs eat and never once have I thought, mm, maybe. You know, like, never, never could I imagine that I would be so hungry that I would be watching pigs eat and think, yeah, I would eat that. I'm so hungry. And yeah, that's where the son is at. And so he, he says, what am I doing? I know that I could go back to my dad. I would never, cons I, I know he would never let me back as a son. Like, I, I would not expect my place back. I've burned through my inheritance. I'm not a son to him anymore. I told him I wish he was dead. But I know he would maybe hire me as a hired worker. Maybe I could, comp I, I could appeal to his kindness, and, and he would just make me one of his hired workers. And I would get there, and, and he would just let me have some food. And so he, he's practicing his speech on his way back. How many of us have done that? Practicing our speech as we have to come back and be like, okay, let me, let me you know, get on my knees. I'm so sorry. And, and, and if you were the father, this is the big part of the story. What would your response be? Because see, we, we see the son coming back and it tells us that the father from the house sees him far in the distance. And we gotta wonder, okay, what happens next? Because once again, if like, if I'm the dad, like, I'm ready. You know what I'm saying? I like, when he's getting there, I'm going to be like, this better be good. This better be good. And I've got some things to say to you. I've got some I told you so's coming. I've got, you know, like, that's, that's what we expect. And yet, that's not what happens. Because once again, who's the one telling us this story? Who's telling us? Jesus. And he's trying to tell us this is how the Heavenly Father looks at you, and this is His grace and His mercy to you. He, and so we would expect that the Father of the house would see Him in the distance and wait for the Son to come up and say, okay, let me hear it. What do you got? But it says that the Father goes running to Him. The Father leaves the porch and goes running to the Son. I mean, the workers would see this and be like, for Him? Like, you're, you're going to just go run out to him? And it says he wraps his arms around him in a bear hug, and he's crying, and, and the son starts in with his little speech, Dad, I don't deserve to be your son again. Just hire me as one of your workers. And it says that the father just says, stop, 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 stop. And, and he says, you know, you're, you're covered in filth. You, you don't have clothes on. And he says, go get the nicest robe and put it around him. Who would have the nicest robe? Who, who would have the nicest robe in the house? The father. That he would cover his filth with his own righteousness. That he would say, no son of mine is going to look like this and feel like this and, and no, no way. And he covers him with that. And he says he, that he puts the signet ring on his finger to show that he is a part of the family. Again, he has reestablished him as an heir, as a son. And he puts sandals on his feet. Guys, that's, that's the picture of mercy. He did not get what he deserved. What he deserved was a tongue lashing from his dad. What he deserved was punishment. And yet he gets received back. And not only that, the father says, let's go throw a feast because my son who is dead is now alive and he was lost and now he is found. And so they throw a giant feast for the son. And, and that's the grace of God, that, that this son hasn't earned any of this. He doesn't deserve any of this. And yet the father is lavishing his grace and mercy upon him. It says while the feast is going on, the other, the other brother, the older brother who stayed and worked, who has watched his dad have to sell off a third of everything he has and knows what his brother's been up to, it says that he hears the party and he won't come in. And it says once again that the father leaves the porch and goes out to him. He says, come on, come to the party for your brother. He says, no, I'm not going in there. He says, he's squandered all your money. He's disrespected you. He, he's 
defamed our family. I'm not going in there. And the father says, look, please come in. He's your brother. He's been lost, and now he's found. And he says, I've worked for you all this time. I've done everything. And the father says, I know. And it's all yours. Nothing, nothing that was yours was taken away. It's all still yours. And I love you, and I'm thankful that you have been a faithful son, and you have followed, and you have obeyed. But your, your brother is lost, and now he's found. Come celebrate with us. And the beauty of the story is this. Jesus, once again, is the one telling this story. And Jesus' message in this story is this, that God's grace and his mercy is for the wayward son and the self-righteous son. That Jesus left, or I'm sorry, the father left the porch for both boys. The father, the father pursued both boys. That that's his grace and his mercy. And so when we, when we look at this story and we try to understand God's grace and his mercy, this is what it's all about. This is what sets Christianity apart from every other world religion. And even within Christendom, we have certain denominations that don't understand what this is trying to teach. Because see, every major world religion, and even some forms of Christianity, they, they have the same arc. It's, there's some initiation, some start, whether it's a, a prayer in your heart or whether it's a baptism or, or whether it's a, some type of initiation, there's some start. And then you, you start following highs and lows, whether you're following, and you meet people along the way and they give you things to read and there's boxes to check and there's things that you need to do and things that you need to think and, and good deeds that you need to accomplish. And, and you go through and then you hit a gate. Every world religion and, and some of the denominations of Christianity, they do this. You, you go through this life and then you hit a gate. And at this gate, there, there's a final assessment on the basis of merit, of whether you get to go through the gate to the other side, to heaven, nirvana, paradise, whatever it is. So there's a scale there. And, and, and the, the, all the major world religions and, and forms of Christianity, um, they, they have this moment where Based on your merit, you find out, do you get to go in? And a lot of Christians, they say, yeah, that's it. Like, you have to do these certain things. You have to be doing good works. You have to check these boxes. You have to have these rituals and these rites. All the major world religions do this. But I want you to hear me. That's not the truth of Christianity. That's what sets it apart from everything else. That's not how Christianity works. Because every other world religion, you get accepted at the very end on the assessment of merit. But Christianity is a relationship and we get the acceptance at the very beginning and that's radical Because that's what Jesus is trying to teach you The father loved the son and the son was already accepted even before he went off and then when he came back The father had already accepted the son Because of the relationship And that's what sets it apart this isn't a, a, Christianity is not a bunch of boxes to check and a bunch of good deeds to do, and then at the end you get to find out whether the gates are open. It is a relationship that you have with Jesus Christ that opens the gates already for you. That's the beauty that we have. And that's what sets it apart. That Jesus came into the world and he said if we listen to him and we follow him, that we would know the truth, that he is the son of God and he is the savior of the world. And if you confess that and you believe that, your relationship with him begins in that moment and eternal life is yours. That in the moment you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior, you have passed from death into life and you would escape the judgment at the end. That the gates are open. That's the good news of the gospel. Because every other religion, you have to atone and pay and earn your way in. Judaism teaches that you atone for your sin by righting the wrongs and changing your behavior and praying and doing good deeds. Islam says that you move towards paradise by performing the five pillars, that you have to accomplish these things, and then you're in. Hinduism claims that we store up enough good karma, and then we will reunite with Brahman, but you have to do all these good things, then you're in. Buddhism says that we can, through enlightenment and discipline and going through the eightfold path, that we do all that, and then we get to to receive nirvana all of these are that way except for christianity because god forgives before you've done anything to earn back that forgiveness the father ran off the porch embraced the son and gave him the feast and the clothes before the son had done anything to earn back the forgiveness that he had the father goes first and you are accepted first and that's the beauty of our our faith because the truth is he is a perfect holy judge what is it that he can be bought off with that we have to offer? 
oh God, I'll do a bunch of good things. And he's like, okay, but you've done a, a bunch of bad things. You, you don't earn it. You don't get it. It's just a gift and it's an acceptance because of the relationship he has for you. And, and the most incredible part is this. Every single one of us, we owe a debt to God. We have failed him. We have, we have hurt others. We have hurt ourselves. We have failed to follow the way he does. And that debt that we owe to God, God sent his son to pay for. God paid the price that you owe him for your debt. And then says, if you just have a relationship with me, it's all yours. And this is what sets Christianity apart. And so the, the question becomes, well, okay, so like that verse that Brady read to us at the beginning, what about my good works? Like, what's the point of those? All these things I'm trying to do, all these, this life I'm trying to live, like, why do I have to do all the good works? Or what, what are the point of all the good works? I mean, don't the good works get me accepted in the end? And the crazy thing is, no, they don't. You're already accepted, and the good works just happen afterwards, but they don't matter for your acceptance. Meaning this, I don't stand up here as a pastor to try and lead this church to say, man, I hope that gets me through on the last day. I hope that gets me accepted on the last day. I'm already accepted. So I do this out of joy. I mean, I think a lot of us, even though we hear this and we know this to be true, we still struggle with truly believing this deep down. And what I mean by that is this. If I were to walk up to you today and say, hey, on the last day as you stand before the pearly gates, are you getting in? I think most of you, your answer would be, I hope so. If we're being honest, it's just subconscious. It slips in like... I, I hope I've done enough. I hope I believe enough. I hope I follow enough. I hope I've done enough. And, and, and we worry that like we're going to get there and it's going to be like a Bible quiz and he's going to be like, all right, you better have your Bible memorized. And it's like a big spinning wheel and we're like, oh, please be John 3, 16. You know, like we just, we, we think like there's some test to get in. And that's the beauty of the gospel is the gates are already open. That as you f come up and you're there before the pearly gates, they're wide open and Jesus is there going, you're here, come on in. Because we already have a relationship and you already know me and come on in. There's no test. You're already there. But, but we don't get it. And, and so let me put it in human terms. Let me put it in human terms for us. Because I think we will recognize it more when we see it in a relationship that we have. Fifteen years ago, I, I knelt down on a knee and I asked my wife to marry me in a park in St. Louis. And I pulled out the ring and showed it to her, you know. Could you imagine if, if it went more like this, that I knelt down and I held out a ring and I opened it up. I said, this is yours in 40 years. If you do everything that I want you to, I will then marry you and accept you and love you. But until then, and I pull out a book, I say, here's what you need to do. And, and in the book, it says 50 rules for me to love you. And, and she opens up and like, item number one is here's all the foods I like to eat. Go to the store and buy them and cook them for me every day. And she's like, oh, okay. And she like flips through. And then like rule number 15 is like the temperature in our house on the thermostat will always be set at this because I will sweat at what you like and you can wear a sweater at what I like. So we will always do this at this temperature. And, and then like she flips the page and, and then like the next one is, you know, you will do all my laundry and you will fold it this way and put it in there just the way I like it. And, and, and all of a sudden, I, I am like, that, that's the book. You do that for 40 years, and then I will, I will give you this ring and say I love you once you've earned it. Or if you don't do these things, you can go back to your parents, right? Like, we would step back and we'd be like, wow, that's pretty harsh. Like, we would never let anybody treat somebody like that, would we? If we saw this in real life, we would be like, you, can, you deserve better. You can do better. Like, get out of that. But see, here's the thing. My wife chooses to do those things. Well, the laundry thing is just because apparently I don't fold right, but <laughs> my wife chooses to do those things not because she believes it will, it will gain her acceptance with me and it will gain her love from me. Why does she do those things? Because she loves me. Because she loves me. And in the same way, so many of us, we don't get the relationship with God right. We think of this relationship between us and God, that God's going, hey, I, I kind of like you right now. Here's a whole bunch of things I want you to do and follow and, and boxes to check. And then at the end, I'll decide whether I love you and you get to come in. And God's going, no, from the very beginning, I've loved you. 
from the very beginning I've given you the ring and said you're mine I've called you my child from day one you are mine you are already accepted and so you have no fear of the last day because I love you in your mind and so each week we've talked about who God is and then I've given you a challenge in response and so as we talk about grace and mercy here is your challenge for today I know that the Holy Spirit is active in this church right now and the Holy Spirit is speaking to your hearts and your mind as you hear this word because God wants to do something in your life. And so I'm going to ask a question in a minute, and I know that the Holy Spirit is going to put a person or a name or a face on your heart, and I want you to recognize that God has done that, and you need to do something with it. And so I'm going to ask you this first question. Who is someone that you need to show more grace to? Grace is receiving what you have not earned or deserved. It is showing kindness to somebody, blessing to somebody, even if they haven't earned it. Who is somebody that you need to show more grace to? I would imagine it is probably somebody sitting right by you right now. It is most likely your spouse, your kids, your sister, your friends, your coworker, whoever it is. Who is someone that you need to show more grace to? Because if we are called to reflect God to other people, that means that we need to be willing to show grace to people that haven't earned it and show kindness and blessing to people that haven't earned it if we're going to reflect who he is. And then the second question is this, and it's much tougher. Who do you need to show mercy to? They haven't earned it. They haven't, they haven't groveled and, and come back to you and they haven't shown you all of the forgiveness that, that they deserve but that you are going to say, you know what? God shows me mercy, and I'm going to show you mercy. Just like the father on the porch, I'm going to come running off that porch, and I'm going to show you grace and mercy that you don't deserve. Too often in a marriage, what ends up causing you to come to my office is two people that are not showing grace and mercy to each other that are instead thinking it's a, a quid pro quo of if you do this, then I'll do this, and if you do that, then I won't do that, and, and Instead of saying, I'm going to show grace and mercy to you. And so we're going to go before the Lord. We're going to bow our heads, close our eyes, and we're going to confess this before our Lord right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that you are a good and gracious God and that you love us and that you show us goodness and kindness even though we don't deserve it. And so, Lord, we come before you, and, and all you ask in response is that we would live lives of repentance, that we would acknowledge that you have shown us undeserved kindness, and that we would confess the things that we have done before you, that we would acknowledge them and turn away from them. And so, Lord, in this time of confession, that's what we do. We, we will silently lift up these things that we know we have done that have hurt you and hurt others and hurt ourselves in our thoughts and our words and our actions. We confess them before you now. Lord Jesus, hear our confession, and also we lift up the topic of this sermon. We know that there are people that we are being hard-hearted towards, that we are not showing grace and mercy to, that you want us to. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us, that you would give us compassion and empathy, that we would see that you have shown us grace and kindness and, and mercy, and that we would extend that to the others that deserve, that don't deserve it, but that we should give it to. Lord, forgive us for the times when we have not been gracious and merciful. And Lord, we come before you and we confess that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have sent your son, Jesus, that you paid our debts on the cross once and for all, paid in full. And Lord, it is by the blood of your son, Jesus, and by his death and resurrection that we come before you and ask that you would forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. In his name, and all God's people said, amen. You see, the reality is this. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. All of us are sinners. All of us have a list of things that we have done that have failed God and failed ourselves and failed others and hurt the people around us. And yet, that debt that we owe God of rebelling against him and not doing what he calls us to do, it, it, it's, it's long 
And yet God sent his son to pay the price for that because he knew you were never capable of earning it. He knew that you would never make it up. He knew that you would never get the scales even. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and he paid it once and for all. The word that Jesus said on the cross was to telestai. When he said it is finished, the Greek word was to telestai. That's the word he said. And it means paid in full. And so on the last day, all of your sins are paid in full. As you get to the pearly gates, it is not fear. It is paid, 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 paid. Your debt is covered to God. Because of God's great love for you, he sent his son to do that. And so the good news that I get to give you this day and every day is this, that you are loved and you are fair, forgiven and you are cherished by our God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, today you have given us a powerful reminder of the grace and mercy that you pour into our lives. Lord, it's true that we do not deserve any of it, but yet you continue to abundantly pour it out. And so we pray that in the days and weeks to come that you would help us to, to embrace that truth, to, to accept it, to, to, to live in that grace each and every single day and help us, Lord, to even pour that out to others the way you have poured it out to us. And we also take a moment then this morning to ask that your grace would be, would be served into the lives of those who need you most at this time. Lord, those who are going through difficulties and challenges, we especially pray today for Jordan, Dan, Nate, Vince, Roland, Barb, Dave, Brad, Annie, Ewan, Corey. And Lord, we continue to pray for the Jip family that you would strengthen Steve and his family at this time. Lord, we continue also to remember the Oltman's family and the Richards family who are in the midst of grief and the loss of loved ones. Lord, grant your grace and your mercy to all those who need you now at this time. Lord, we also thank you for the incredible work that you do in sharing your gospel throughout this world. We especially thank you today for the Hutton family Lord, in the work that they are doing in Costa Rica. We thank you for the faith you've put into their hearts and for the hearts of service you've given to them as they serve in your hands and feet. Lord, we ask that you would grant them safety, grant them provision, and grant them continued growth as you work through them. And Lord, today we also pray for all families. We pray for relationships between husbands and wives and parents and children, friends and coworkers. Especially pray for those relationships, Lord, where there is strain and where there is difficulty, where there is tension, that you would make yourself known in these situations, Lord, and that you would mold all of our hearts to be filled with humility and compassion. And finally, Lord, we ask for your blessing upon our church family right here at Grace Hill and, and this community that you've placed us in. May we continue to serve and honor you. We ask that you would watch over and guide our efforts as we praise your name and as we shine your light in this world. Lord Jesus, these and all things we pray now in your holy name as we pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let me send you out with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May he look upon you with favor and give you his peace. And all God's people said, amen.